We've got a fresh episode that's sizzling hot and it's being served up for you US style. Yes, it's a bit of an American special, but not because of the products, just the locations. Welcome to a brand new episode of CNB. I am Siddharth Panayak Patankar and with me right now is the new generation of the BMW X5. I am just outside of Atlanta in Georgia, but we're going to first scoot across to California. Nice and sunny and great weather, great riding routes. Preetam Bora spending time with the much anticipated Royal Enfield 650 Twins. Now, these bikes have been a long time coming. We finally get our chance to get them out on the road. Two bikes, one common platform. The Royal Enfield 650 Twins. The newest, most modern Royal Enfield motorcycles built around a brand new 650cc parallel twin engine. Spend a day riding the new Royal Enfield Interceptor 650 along the Pacific Coast Highway or Highway 1 as it is also known and along with some twisty mountain roads. And after the first 40 kilometers along Highway 1, it's immediately clear that the Interceptor is unlike any other Royal Enfield. So that's the bike we're riding first, the Royal Enfield Interceptor 650. And I can tell you one thing, this is the best Royal Enfield that I've ever ridden so far. In fact, the Royal Enfield that we know, this one is nothing at all like the, any of the other Enfields that we have seen or ridden so far. 650 series parallel twin, very smooth, very refined, slick gearbox, very light touch, could have been lighter but yes it's quite light, would be very good in our traffic conditions. And the engine revs freely, you can redline through the gears, there's no sense of the motor straining as such. Absolutely perfect. Uh, power figures, as you all know, 47 BHP, 53 Nm not overwhelming but yes enough grunt and it pulls very very clearly from as low as 2500 to 2700 rpm that's where the meat of the power bend is just in the 3000 rpm up to about 5000 5500 rpm yes there's a small buzz at around 5000 rpm but nothing to complain about it's not at all like any of the vibrations we've seen in the singles so far the styling is understated and looks like a typical British modern classic inspired by the 1960s Brit bike styling, yet modern in every other way. The upswept twin exhausts look and sound good and the Interceptor 650 comes in three different variants. Standard, custom and chrome, each with the same engine and cycle parts but different colors and emblems. The instrument console is a twin pod unit with a small digital screen displaying two trip meters, a fuel gauge and odometer, but a clock and gear position indicator are missed. The Interceptor also gets standard dual channel ABS by Bosch. And there are no other electronic rider aids. So, no ride by wire, no riding modes and no traction control. On the move, the engine is smooth and refined and high speeds of around 100 to 120 km per hour is achieved without any apparent effort. In fact, we clocked well beyond 160 km per hour and there is no sign of the motor straining or feeling out of steam. And when the twisty bits come up, we are equally impressed with the handling. Handling wise, it's a top bike. We've been riding this twisted in California all day today and it really can take corners like anything. Brakes, standard dual channel ABS, very good. It's not to the sport bike level, but for this kind of bike, it's absolutely perfect. Enough bite, enough progression, excellent brakes, excellent handling, and a party piece of this bike is the motor. A smooth and reasonably fast-paced engine, great road manners, good brakes, and a lot of color options to choose from. Most of all, the Interceptor 650 just made Royal Enfield a very desirable name once again. It looks great, it rides great and we're really enjoying riding this here in California today. But how reliable is the bike? That's the question many of you would be asking. Well, Royal Enfield has tested several prototypes over and over again. The ECU itself took many many iterations, three iterations to come to this, the final production stage. 
and we are told the bike has been ready for 6 months but they took 6 more months to test it again and again and again and now Royal Enfield is offering a 3 year 40,000 km warranty on the bike so that itself speaks about the confidence the company has in this product the new Interceptor 650 The Continental GT name makes a comeback with Royal Enfield's new 650cc platform. So it's now called the Continental GT 650, a brand new cafe racer from the ground up. But while it shares a lot with the Interceptor 650, it's meant to have a sportier personality. It's built on the same chassis, same engine. Essentially it's built on the same 650cc twin platform. But this one has got a slightly sporty twist. So it's got clip-on handlebars, the fuel tank is different, the seat is different. So you sit crouched down low, it's a sportier bike, it's said to handle better. And that's what we're going to find out. The Continental GT650 has 1960s cafe racer styling, complemented by upswept twin exhausts and a classic twin pod instrument console. The engine is the same 649cc air-cooled counterbalanced parallel twin as the Interceptor 650. The 18-inch spoked wheels come with Pirelli tyres with tubes and braking is handled by Bybury calipers gripping a 320mm single disc on the front wheel and a 240mm disc at the rear. And yes, there's standard Bosch dual channel ABS. But the Continental GT650 is also lighter than its sibling. When the Interceptor 650 weighs 202 kilos without fuel, the Conti GT weighs 198 kgs without fuel. It's uh, lighter by 4 kilos. And that's because the differences are here. The steering yoke is different. This one's got clip-ons. That's where the weight is safe. And uh, brackets for the foot pegs are different than the Interceptor 650. That's also the weight. But the main difference is that the Conti GT doesn't come with a stock center stand. the move, it is immediately apparent that the Continental GT650 has a more committed, more aggressive riding position. But it's not outright uncomfortable and you soon get used to that. The counterbalanced 649cc parallel twin is smooth, refined and can easily hit speeds in excess of 160 km per hour. And out on the twisty mountain road, the GT650 feels a little more eager to dip in and out of corners. And those small differences in the weight, the ergonomics and the riding position make the GT650 feel a lot different than the Interceptor 650. It's more intuitive in its handling capabilities, it's more eager to turn and you can take corner after corners, it feels more planted, more stable at high speeds. Along with the Interceptor 650, the Conti GT650 is expected to be launched sometime in November. Expect prices to be competitive around 3 lakh rupees. Given the level of engineering and the design work too, the 650 twins are the best motorcycles in Royal Enfield's modern history. So now we'll get straight to the new generation of the BMW X5. In its fourth generation now, the car hits the market in 2019 and uh, there's a lot of expectation around this car for several reasons. There's styling, of course, that's different, but it's also gotten more modern and it promises to be more agile and just all around more athletic than the outgoing car. Now, for the longest time, the X5 was the benchmark when it came to what BMW calls the sports activity vehicle segment. Does the new car deliver? Well, of course, I've driven it and I'm going to tell you. The new fourth generation BMW X5 is here. The 
America aims to get better in every sense and I'm here in the US for its first drive to find out if that has happened. Now you know you've got a good thing going when you've sold more than 2 million units of a model line across only 3 generations. And so with the X5, going into the 4th generation BMW knew it didn't want to mess with the proposition too much while of course improving on the last car. Now two clear areas that came in as key demands for this new model development says BMW. One, a lot of customers and even the management frankly wanted the car to be a lot more sporty and two, markets like India and China, demands coming in from there to make it even more comfortable. Now that's of course being pulled in two different directions but the engineers say they've managed to create a good balance and offer a fair amount of extra on both those ends. I'm driving the X5 xDrive 30D. The 3 liter inline 6 makes 260 horses and delivers a healthy 620 Nm. This is essentially a tweaked version of the last X5's 3 liter diesel and you can do 0 to 100 km per hour in 6.5 seconds. India will also get the X-Drive 40i with a 3 liter inline 6 petrol engine that makes 333 bhp. Now globally BMW will be offering two diesels and two petrols at the start. We'll have to wait and see officially, finally, on what uh, gets decided for India, but it seems likely that we'll have one of each. And uh, there is, of course, a plug-in hybrid that's expected globally next year. We won't be getting that in a hurry. But remember, with some of the changes that are happening on the policy front, it's cars like that that could uh, just play a flagship role. Very minimal volume, but uh, maximum impact in terms of PR or, or marketing reach. And so that plug-in hybrid, don't just rule it out completely for India. Maybe not next year, but couple of years down the line yeah you might see it the car seems a tad less eager than the last one but lag is reduced now and the power delivery is more linear you also get the same 8-speed gearbox that remains quick smooth and effective now the previous generation car was already crammed with a fair amount of the electronics on board especially when the facelift came in a few years ago but a lot of those systems do see an improvement on this car and interestingly it's not just been reserved for the 7 series for a change you're seeing some of those making an, a first appearance if you will for BMW on the X5 now I'll get into details on what I'm talking about but I think one of the things that really stands out for me straight away is the uh, two axle air suspension that is different it does make uh, things a lot better for you in terms of both the dynamic end of the performance spectrum and also what you can do with the car off-road of course that also means you have to opt for the optional air suspension it's not standard on the Indian model though I suspect it just might be now the X5 takes the DSCI electro hydraulic brake system a little bit further one step further if you will from what was first introduced on the 7 series so it still works the same way it's drive by wire it's not a direct link between the pedal and your uh, actual brakes and the advantage say BMW engineers is in extreme dynamic situations where uh, you could have uh, you know a lot of people lifting their foot off too early in an emergency braking situation especially when ABS kicks in in this case that kind of feedback never travels back to the pedal and which is why you're likely to be more effective in your braking given this new system the handling is good but not as good as the last cars while there is ample agility the athleticism is a touch lacking We have active roll stabilization and integral active steering. Of course, all of these fancy terms just adds up to a bunch of more wires running through the system and, of course, a lot more software that's controlling everything. So, uh, what does that mean for you? 
well quite simply it makes things a lot easier for you because you require minimum input as a driver and yet you can get a lot more from the car in dynamic terms so uh, cornering or hard cornering especially like what I had back there was nothing compared to what you might want to push this car into well you can do that with the assurance where it also helps is when you take the X5 off-road and this is where that compromise in dynamic performance starts to fade away the new X5 is definitely more capable off-road so as is customary on most of these SUV driving experiences there's an instructor there's a little bit of a forest for an off-road experience with the new X5 yep you'll hear the car dinging and doing all sorts of things in here with all the sensors going off and uh, every once in a while of course the instructor telling me what to do on the walkie-talkie as well but uh, the whole idea here is to just display the capability the new X5 brings in it is all designed to stay within the limits of this vehicle of course but that doesn't stop me from having some fun so far it's been pretty tame but I've been told it might get a little more exciting as I get deeper into the forest the X5 finally gets terrain modes sand rock gravel or snow since it had rained the previous day the surface was sticky slippery and nicely muddy I selected the X rocks mode which raises the car by 40 millimeters over the standard 214 millimeter clearance So the onboard computer is always telling the uh, all-wheel drive system how much traction and torque to send to which wheel. There's always going to be a complete monitoring of what's happening with the uh, overall chassis and the different axles. So add to that hill descent control and then a whole, b whole bunch of other electronics. The different camera views, all of these sensors dinging off every now and then. And I'll tell you what, you're not doing a whole lot more than simply steering for the most part. <laughs> part that uh, worries me is when all of that becomes autonomous as well and I can tell you that's not far away I hope it doesn't happen too soon though because it will just completely kill any element of fun that's left in an experience like this yes the X5 is now more capable as an off-roader and it offers you good traction grip and even a decent wading capability but don't start comparing it with the hardcore 4x4s just yet the new X5 is a bit bigger now with 36 millimeters added to its length 66 millimeters to its width and it's 19 millimeters more in height terms the wheelbase has increased by 42 millimeters in terms of overall styling attribute the car will certainly straight away remind you of the X5 that's uh, just bowed out the third generation car and the fourth well they do look kind of similar but you start to see just a little more tension in that metal it's got a nice stretched muscular feel to it and of course there are these distinct elements that straight away tell you that this isn't just a facelift it is a new generation the big grill that's a dead giveaway much more modern headlamp cluster and that new blue x element that's there in the not quite twin rings anymore that's again what we've started to see more and more the new x3 the x2 they all have that but then you start to see that element of muscle as i said along the side i think is where you really pick up on it because it has this really taut feel and then unlike what you've seen from bmw in the past there's a nice almost curved line that travels up and then into the tail lamp again the very distinct styling feature on the new x5 the new tail light i have to say looks very different the graphic the l-shaped graphic is really nice too and it makes the rear of the car look kind of wide and more horizontal than it ever did look before the electric split tailgate is cool and the boot gives you 650 to 1870 liters of space depending on whether you have the seats folded up or down certainly a really fresh cabin for the X5 and even though there are certain elements here in styling terms that you've started to see on the other X models like the X2 or the X3 this is still certainly really very new the two screens really dominate that both 12.3 inch and this one of course very new because compared to the last X5 
everything changes and this is also the first BMW model to get the latest 7.0 operating system from uh, BMW and so what that means is completely new interface very intuitive touch screen different layout you're gonna find this really more modern and a lot more pleasing and sort of fun and, and young compared to the iDrive that you've been used to seeing lots of functions on the virtual cluster as well and the layout I have to say the graphics really nice they complement that big huge muscular grill up front and all of that muscle that you see running around on the metal well you kind of get a sense of that from the layout here on the instrument cluster and I like that you do see similar angular elements down here as you come further down there's a little screen that gives you the uh, temperature control and of course those shortcut keys that we've started getting used to now from BMW and then the volume control the gear shift the uh, iDrive and also the start stop button have this glass element that's certainly very new and different for BMW the cup holders you can uh, have them be either cooling or heating depending on the kind of drink you put in there so if it's a cup of coffee you can keep it warm if it's a nice cold cola well you can keep it chilled so that's new wireless charging is optional and that finally of course has started to become more or less available across most of the premium products lots of USB charging points including uh, the mini USB the C uh, points as well two USBs in the back panoramic sunroof I could go on because of course the list of features is endless one last thing though, there's a shortcut key now for the massage function for the front seats. That is certainly new and uh, you do get ventilation for cooling and uh, of course heating for the seats as well. There is the option of the third row of seats and getting there is easier with row 2 now folding up electrically to allow access to the rear. The Bowers & Wilkins Diamond Surround Sound System with 20 speakers and a 1500 watt output is good too. And besides the ambient air package, ambient lighting, you also get the panorama glass roof that has the sky lounge feature with LED graphics embedded into the glass. All of this from the 7 series. Bunch of us have been driving the car today and we have an interesting split on uh, the character of this engine the three liter inline six diesel i think it sounds great because it sounds a lot more refined than the last car a lot of people like the growl on the last one so like i said we have a little bit of a split vote on that but uh, but yeah i like it because i think that sense of refinement coming through so definitely is something that buyers in this uh, particular segment will appreciate especially with the uh, buyers who are looking for a little bit of extra in terms of performance they want that punch and yet they don't want to spend on the top spec version so the 30d will i think pretty much make up a bulk of sales of course in india but perhaps in europe as well i really liked the sound and it egged me on to push the car further spending the many hours driving the new x5 here in georgia has given me enough confidence to say that bmw has done enough to worry rivals. The new BMW X5 will arrive in India only late next year, but 2019 promises to bring us a lot of Bimmer SUVs. The X5 of course, the X4 and maybe the X2. And then there will be the mighty X7 too that will follow. So as always, plenty packed into this half hour. I hope you've enjoyed it. And you're going to react to all that hot new metal that we've shown you. All of these products are coming your way over the next few months. Promise me you'll also wear your seatbelts or your helmets. And join us next week. Bye-bye.